welcome to the re-recording of the Software and Coding Roundtable um, that uh, we held in, um, on May 4th. Um, the discussion of the Software and Computing Roundtable was um, um, on user-centered design. It started with a presentation on um, creating good user experience and an update on exploring user-centered design for the Electron Ion Collider. We then um, have two presentations on how to improve um, a software stack, um, automated workflow for end-to-end -end simulations and um, detector optimizations, and key for help the turnkey software stack. The first presentation is um, um, uh, on uh, creating good user experience um, by uh, Travis Wiggins. Um, Travis is a user experience user interface designer with a, sp a specialty in leading the design and user experience of um, interfaces, applications, and, and websites. Um, he works as a um, user experience design consultant um, in Chicago. Clients um, of Travis include um, Best Buy, the Major League Baseball, Humana, um, and um, many other top tier companies. Um, I cannot introduce um, Travis um, without mentioning his second passion, music. Um, uh, songs by Travis have been featured on networks um, such as um, um, CBS or HBO um, and also um, have been used um, in um, video games. Um, so um, thank you for this re-recording, uh, Travis. Uh, thanks, Marcus, and, and thanks for having me. Um, so what I'm going to be discussing uh, today is creating good user experiences. And the goal of the presentation is to improve your knowledge of the user experience process and how you can use it to build better systems. Um, and so it's gonna be you know, pretty short, 20, 25 minutes. We have some questions at the end. Um, so we're gonna go kind of quick. Uh, separated it into three parts. Uh, part one is, is talking about the user experience process. Um, so some of the industry standards, we'll walk through the process. I'll talk about common buzzwords and, and concepts and frameworks that we use for this. Um, part two is about the buy-in. So even though you understand the process, how do you get uh, leadership on board to um, you know, follow some of these ideas to make better systems? And number three are, are uh, some tips and best practices, uh, some stuff that I've learned over the years that I think would be helpful to other people, whether you're a, a UX designer or a designer of systems or not, I think it, could, it can help you in ways. Um, a little bit about me, Marcus covered a lot. I have 18 years of uh, design UX, UX experience. Um, I'm also, um, as far as job roles, I've been a product owner, which is more basically like um, running a product and, and making decisions to make that product better. Um, and I've also run software projects from end to end. So you're working from like concept all the way to like delivering a, an application or a website. Uh, and, and one thing, uh, you know, my, the experiences I'm trying to share with you today, I've built software systems of all sizes at all different types of companies. So I've worked with, you know, Best Buy, Major League Baseball, and huge companies. But I've also worked just one-on-one -on -one with, with people who are, who are coming up with a new idea. Uh, so some of this is going to be coming from, you know, a lot of different angles um, of what could work. And if you want to check out more of my work, you could check uh, out TravisLeeWiggins.com or portfolio.travisleewiggins.com goes to some examples of my work. Uh, so first of all, starting out, what is user experience? Um, when in the user experience world, you talk about users a lot with a capital U. So the user does this, the user is in this location. And a user is a user of systems, of software, one of the many active users in the world. Um, you're probably familiar with this concept in 2021, at least a little bit. Uh, and user experience, just to look like level set us with a capital UX, so you might be hearing UX a lot, uh, that means user experience. It's the process, what, I, what I've defined it here, is the process of breaking down and designing a system and its users and viewing it from the user's perspective in an effort to improve the design and the functionality for the people that are going to use it. So we've got the user and then the user experience is about, you know, putting that user in the middle and, and designing the experience for them. Uh, so why is user experience important? Well, I believe that good UX or, or, or user interface elements improves people's lives. 
Um, it decreases frustration. It increases our enjoyment of products and services. It saves time. It can save money. And bad UX can be deadly. You know, like look at what happened with the 737 Max with, with the way that those windows were designed uh, to get to that like system that, that was not functioning properly. Um, so a lot of times what you'll see is like an overlap with product design because really what user experiences in the digital realm, it's a digital experience and, and digital experiences can also be products. So even though this is a catch up bottle, you can see how like it would apply, I think to like a digital experience as well. All right, so now I'm gonna go quickly through the, the process. Um, so the, the process of developing a user experience is, is kind of like identifying the user, uh, really planning out what you wanna build and then kind of iterating on it. So on the left, we've got kind of the process and I'm gonna walk through each of these steps. So I'm not gonna repeat them here. And then, but what you'll see is as we're working through the process of the UX, we're also bringing in users themselves just to validate that we're building it uh, for the user correctly. Um, so the kind of the first step in the process of UX is excitement screens. Uh, I usually don't put this in a deck, but like now I think I, I realized when I was making this that this is a big part of the process. So excitement screens are initial designs that gets everyone excited and it creates a quick visual on what you wanna build so everyone can wrap their head around it. Sometimes when you're trying to explain like, like if you were to build a house, you might have like the initial architecture drawing. You don't know the rooms yet, but you kind of know what it looks like. That's what these excitement screens are. And I think they're a big part of the process because it, it gets everyone's heads kind of wrapped around it it's sometimes you see some final UI that kind of goes through because it was the initial inspiration. Uh, the next step, and it's usually wanted to come forward is the system requirements. So this is like the recipe of your software. So it really should outline what's necessary to create the experience, but being a, a UX designer for so long, I can say that most of the time the recipes aren't accurate. And it feels like uh, what mostly what you're doing from the user experience process is flushing out the requirements. Because uh, you may write you know, through a recipe how to cook something, but really the nuances are really lost uh, from, from that kind of level. So you're, you're trying to figure out all the nuances too. Um, kind of the next step is uh, user personas. So you got to define who's going to use the system. And you do this by user personas. So what you wanna do is define who's gonna use it, who's gonna be using the program, their, app, their habits, um, when they're gonna be using your, your program or system and, and why. And what you really wanna do is, is define several of these because a lot of times you don't have one group of users, you have several group of users that are using your system for different purposes. So you wanna make sure you identify that. And uh, sometimes, you know, you get down to, you know, their background, like, like these users will have certain type of ba uh, similar backgrounds. Like I worked on a project that was uh, for Medicare. So most people were in an older class and they had like vision problems or they, they didn't like working with computers. So that's something we had to think about when we designed that system is here's a population that doesn't like using computers and would rather, rather do stuff on paper. Uh, and where, where you get some of that information is from user interviews. So once you think you've identified some of who you think your audience is, you can define them more accurately by, by pulling in some of those people and ask them about the system you're gonna build and see what would benefit them. And you're basically like have a uh, interview to uh, validate you know, your initial ideas um, to make sure you're not missing anything at, the, at this stage. Um, and so now that you know a little bit about the person, you build out what, what's called a user journey. And a user journey is basically that user's path through your system. And sometimes with the user journey, you might add aspects of things that are a little bit outside the system, like maybe an API data element comes in from another system. And so you're really trying to out, you know, uh, kind of map out visually uh, what their experience is going to be. And what you'll see is that if you have multiple user types, like I was talking about, you might have a couple different user journeys. Um, and that's going to help you really build a system that's going to work for um, 
more people. Uh, here's kind of another angle. Uh, similar to the user journey, we have something called the service organizational map. And this is kind of the same thing as the user journey, except you've added what they call swim lanes to see where uh, the touch points are within a, a system on a service basis. So the best way to explain this is like when you go to an airport, uh, you go, you know, you get out of the cab and you go through the front and there's a desk and there's someone at that desk. You interact with that person at the desk and that's kind of one section of the system. So that would be one swim lane. Then you go to the next session, which is like security. So security would be another uh, section. And then you, you get in and then maybe you go to another ticket counter inside. So what you're trying to do is identify, uh, sometimes in UX, the most difficult parts are between systems. So if you're connecting different systems in an experience, like in an airport, you wanna see where those touch points are and make sure that the flow like really works for the person. Um, you know, some airlines really have this, like this handled, and this is how you do this type of thing um, to make sure it's a, it's a great experience. Uh, and, and kind of one more map that we use in the UX world is what we call a, a workflow or user flow. So this is similar to the user journey, but it kind of only outlines what's in the system. So you can see like there, there are times when it's good to, to like, you know, look more eagle eye at what's going outside. And then there's times let's just focus on what's going on in the system here. And that's more of this. And sometimes with a workflow or user flow, you might pull in like databases or, or like where information's coming from, or like in this case, like an email gets sent out. Um, so that's a, kind of another way to look at it. Um, so now that we've got like a map and a system built out, we know who our users are. Now in this version that I'm going to show you, we're going to build some software. So Kind of the next step is to make some wireframes. So wireframes would be like line drawings, very simple to design. Sometimes they're sketches. Um, but the idea here is to, to make sure that the functionality works. So does the system go from, from you know section to section smoothly? Is do we understand what the user needs to do in each step of the process? And so what you want to do here is separate the design and the elements and the styling and really concentrate on functionality and just making sure everything uh, ties together. And if you have that, I mean, you pretty much have the logic of your system built. And then from there, you can prototype that wireframe. Uh, so we have this idea of a clickable prototype and you can do this with, with like line drawings or you can do it with full-fledged designs. But the idea here is, you know, put this in someone's hands in the actual situation and uh, you know, let them have a clickable experience that feels real and watch them go through it. Um, this, this lets you make you know, big adjustments. You haven't written any code yet. You can make bigger adjustments to the flow. And I believe it saves lots of time and money to, to plan all this stuff out before you get, you know, before you just start writing code. Um, and user, here's another point I think user testing makes a lot of sense. So, we kind of brought in some people at the very beginning to make sure that what we we're building is, you know, validated and we get some more ideas in here. Now we want to test, did we build the right thing? So you can use that prototype and have people click through and you, you do a thing called user testing where you, uh, you basically have asked them to perform a lot of actions on your software, ask them to speak out loud and, uh, then get, gauge their reactions and just write it all down. You wanna create an environment that you're not pressuring them and you're really, it's a chance for you to see someone use your experience you know, without uh, having any um, opinions. Uh, so that's very important in the process. And then we finally get to design. Now that we have the prototype and we've got it kind of all sketched out, we have requirements in place so we know what we're building. Uh, I consider the you know design is making it all pretty and easy to use, creating a visual style that's consistent, um, so that when you go one page to the next, uh, all the buttons are are the same and it feels like uh, completed really. And you're also thinking of like you know button styles and different states and air styles and feedback mechanisms for the visual language at this point. Uh, and I think we've hit upon this, but this idea of like as you're learning through, through each of these kind of deliverables. So if you make a workflow and you, and you learn a couple things, you incorporate that feedback right away. 
So by the time you reach the prototype point, you kind of iterated on your idea 15 times already. Uh, so you're, you're not looking at version one, you're almost looking at version 15, uh, even before you, know, it, it, you start building anything um, with code. Uh, so what this does, you know, the, combining all of this whole process, uh, the bigger picture, what it accomplishes is we've planned, we've tested it, we've brought in different opinions, we've iterated on the idea, and hopefully we've built a better system. And in the, in the future, I believe that if you, if you plan your systems out, uh, you save time and money because you can also plan a little bit for the future uh, because there's stuff that are, isn't going to make it in your software. So you create a, a roadmap to kind of work on that stuff in the future. So and another thing I want to say here is, you know, we don't always go into every aspect of this process. You know, on smaller apps, I might just jump right into a prototype and start designing without wireframes. But on a big project that has a lot of different user types, you know, a lot of screens, a lot of different technologies, it requires more of this, I think, to uh, um, really get a good system in place. So I think the bigger, more people, the more you have to do more, more of these kind of things. Um, I'm going to go to part two, um, the buy-in. So we tend to see this, uh, we tend to view user experience as democratic and holistic. We take info from stakeholders, users, creative styles, platforms, and, and we combine it all into the perfect circle of like best product or best experience. So that's what I've tried to you know, show you so far is that it's taking a lot of these diverse elements and putting them together. But the tricky part is, is that we still, uh, you know, the, the hole in the, the process here is most organizations and governmental institutions are still set up as a top-down structure. So what you have to do is always make sure that the person with the business and the purse strings are elevated in importance. So if one of their ideas or one of their user experience ideas was, uh, you know, brought up, I bet, basically you, you have to make sure that you give it a prominent place. Um, and they may not understand what you're doing. Uh, so what I, what I see that as is you need buy-in from the purse strings. Uh, you have to prioritize. And what I found is you don't need to change everything for the important leader. But what you have to do is if they mention something, make sure it's front and center. Make sure when you're, you're giving the presentations that they see their idea uh, in there and right away. And what this helps out the system is if the system can get more uh, you know, budget and more money, that's going to make the system better so that you can spend that money elsewhere. So I always think of like, how can you get leadership buy-in and how can you um, bring them into the process? And this doesn't just work for one leader, like in this hierarchical hierarchy, you might have several leaders that you have to bring in. So, you know, UX is a balance of, you know, um, giving the user what they want, but also realizing that there's, there's a structure in place that you have to kind of work through. Uh, and I always like to think of the leader as the goalie. You know, sometimes I've been on projects where you have just amazing ideas, but the goal, but the leader's like the goalie not letting anything through. So you have to realize that that's, that's leadership and that's, they have to, you know, uh, they've got a lot more on their plate to worry about too. So um, this is just an aspect I think is, is always helpful to build in. Travis, you are now 15 minutes in. Okay, cool. I've got just a couple tips and best practices I think will be kind of fun. Should just take a couple minutes and then we can uh, kind of open it up to discussion, I think, Marcus. Um, so one is uh, prioritize features. So we have a thing in, uh, in system design called road mapping and MVP, minimum viable product. And I think they work together. When you build your system for the first time, just try to build it with you know, the most valuable element as part of it, but you know, plan it out so that you have a roadmap. So you know what you're doing three months from now, six months from now. I like to design systems so that they gradually get bigger. Um, and so that way you have something to show for your work and it's not like, oh, it's gonna be ready in three years. It's like, we have the most important element first and then we know what we're gonna work on. And then it lets you adjust as people use the software. Um, another thing is like, inventing simplicity. So I work a lot with you know, decision fatigue. Like on the left, we have a mom and pop uh, 
a restaurant menu. And, and the idea when you go into a place like that is you can have anything you want. And that is opposite of this idea of we're going to tell you what you want based on data and based on like what's good for us. Like I love how McDonald's was able to take ordering food and just have it be a one syllable number. You filter the entire menu for someone. Like I appreciate that in this day and age where you go into the supermarket aisle and there's like 30 flavors of Cheez-Its. There's too much decisions. Like make the, help me make the decisions. I think the software should help. A uh, good experience is not just designers. You know, ideas come from everywhere. I always try to stay open and I show people who are working on the project, show people who aren't. And, you know, the user experience has a goal of improving a system in any way possible. And small changes can have a big impact. And, and ideas in, in my systems that I design come from everybody on the team. And every small change is a win in my book. But I'll also say that designers are usually the best people for the job because we have uh, things like color theory, layout, um, we've worked with fonts and designs. We've worked with design software. And a lot of designers have a very visual way of thinking. And since software is very eye based, you know, you, you do need sometimes someone who can think visually. And, you know, sometimes people have visual talent, whether they're, they're uh, you know, designers or artists or not. And uh, a few last things is, uh, you know, a good user experience can be just as much art as science. You know, one thing I love about uh, Einstein is that a lot of his theories that he came up with, they're just proving now. So it takes a lot of imagination and for, for anything science-based still, like we can't lose sight of that. And even because we created a good recipe doesn't mean the food is good. Uh, Rick Bayless is like a famous uh, chef here in Chicago. And just because you have the recipe, there's all these nuances in cooking. And that's where, that's what makes a really great interface is like those nuances. And, uh, you know, just this idea I'd like to leave you guys with, or is just, uh, you know, you don't all, it's hard to reach perfection when it comes to the UX world. What I try to do is, was this better than it was? Did I make it better for everybody? Uh, because most of my projects are time box. So someone will, will say, okay, Travis, we'll give you five hours. What can you do to make this better? And so I'm constantly thinking, what are the biggest picture things I can do? So I'm always trying to make, think of superstar moments for the software. What's gonna make the, the software really work for a lot of people and, and not worry about small stuff. Like what's the homepage look like? What's visible, you know, forget perfect software and just try to make like the winning shot essentially. Um, and so I hope through all this, you know, we achieved my goal of, I wanted to improve your knowledge of user experience process. Hopefully you can take some of this and, and think about it a different way and, and help, you know, build a better system. Thank you much, Travis. This, um, this was very enlightening. Um, are there questions? I see in the um, chat two questions. Um, Mark, um, I guess both questions are from you. Yeah, there's a lot of questions today. Uh, OK, so the first one is, um, what is it? Oh, yeah, you said when you're doing the user testing, um, don't lead them. You know, you got to let them find the weaknesses, right? Uh, if you say too much, then they're gonna, they're gonna follow what you say and, and they're gonna, you know, you want them to, you want, you want to see where they go off the rails, but then I can imagine a situation where right off the bat, the first 30 seconds, they crash into the wall, right? And nothing goes anywhere and you're not making any progress. You just can't sit there and, you know, and watch them flap, you know, flop around. So like, you know, uh, what's the guidance there? Yeah, there is a balance. Like sometimes, like on that Medicare project I talked about earlier, uh, uh, what was it four out of seven people would not scroll on a website page because they were an older audience. They would just say, "Yeah, if it's below the fold, I'm not going to scroll." I was like, <laughs> "I was like, how am I going to design for someone who you know doesn't scroll?" But I, I think the the main point is is uh, what I like to do in user testing is get people to do actions. So you can say, um, okay, so you need to complete like purchasing a, an airline ticket on this page. Can you, can you do that? And then they, and then say, speak out loud. So when they, they're, you can see them hovering the mouse. You're like, okay, so I'm gonna go up here and I can see there's tickets up here and I can see there's flights here. Maybe I type it in here and then you can see them type it in. So uh, you want them, you wanna basically like them to feed your, their brain like what they're doing 
Uh, so sometimes you do help them. You'd be like, okay, so I can see you're struggling a little bit. Like, why don't you try it here on the left? Or why don't you try to go below the fold? So you don't, you definitely, there's a balance between letting them struggle and then, yeah. So you do want them to struggle a bit, but not get frustrated maybe. Yeah. So let's switch it up, Mark, uh, before we go to your second question. There's also Casey who has a question. Very good. Hi. Um, so part of this user experience is the walls that people run into. You know, it's maybe coding up ways to stop them from hitting the wall or reverting going back the other direction or stop measures to direct the users. Where does that fit in, like, overall? in this scheme that you've laid out? Like, uh, so, so you're hitting areas in the process that the user's like completely stopped and they don't know where to go next? Yeah, like where it would just break the user experience and then the frustration sets in. Yeah, well, usually before I would get to user testing, I would identify something like that in a workflow probably. Okay. So I'd be able to see, you know, when, when the user gets to this point, we don't want any of this designed and this is broken. Um, so usually you see those kinds of breakages before the user testing, but sometimes you do see it during the user test. And then maybe you have to stop the user test and, and you know, uh, uh, work on your system before you bring more people in. <laughs> I've, I've seen stuff like that where like, you know, the software will break where you're trying to do demos or something. And then you just have to kind of say, you know, um, we're gonna come back to this. Yeah, I find that in the types of software that we're using, typically, uh, there's a lot of people that have a lot of control, right? They can do anything. Users are capable of anything, even if they don't have the knowledge to use those tools. So it's like, mm -hmm. what you is stop them from even being able to use them in the first place in some cases. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's difficult. And that's one thing that um, we work on with the user roles. Like, so as you've kind of men as you're kind of mentioning you might have like this user persona here and then when you go through their user journey you actually don't want them to touch up upon a lot of the application so within a system you'll create a user role where this person will only see a portion of the application that's probably a lot of the way that we approach that because we do design a lot of software that's for a lot a lot of different people so what you do a lot is hide hide things for some people and show it to others using like user roles might be the easiest way. All right, thank you. And Mark has a related question to that, which then also will be our last question to Travis. Okay, so you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the boss problem. Uh, that's very clear. You have to, uh, you have the, the goalie analogy, I, I get that, that's good. But even in, within the team, you know, in the democratic sort of uh, open, inclusive, open to ideas aspect of the things, sometimes people get really bad ideas and the whole group starts jumping up and down. And, yeah, yeah, we gotta do this, we gotta do this. And it's, and then you know from experience, you've seen, you, you've seen that, uh, that, that uh, movie before and you know it ends badly. And so sometimes, you know, you have to have a way of weeding, uh, well, so, Basically, is how do you deal with that kind of situation? How do you kill bad ideas then enter the process? Got it. Uh, that's actually a really good question. Thanks for that. Um, you know, kind of how I approach it is I'm able to act as a, uh, a central command being a UX designer. And so as I get all these ideas from different places, um, sometimes you're able to mold the idea to appeal, like to get the bad idea in there, but get it in there where it's not so bad and maybe not so prominent. Um, and that works a lot with sometimes this leadership that I'm talking about too. Like, and the, I could probably do a whole kind of special on like, how do, what do you do with a bad idea that needs to be in there? <laughs> but yeah, some of it is, you know, if it's, if the whole group is on board, sometimes you, you kind of have to do it to get everyone's buy-in because it's like a band. You know, if, if you're playing the guy's bass parts, he's not going to want to play bass anymore. That's the way I said it because <laughs> I've done that before. Uh, you got to keep everyone involved. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's a difficult one. But I would say, you know, sometimes there's ways 
to like minimize a bad idea or to turn a bad idea into a good idea or to put the bad idea on a separate page and then, to, you know, to separate that experience. Um, yeah, because that's, that's something I work on a lot of teams with a lot of different people who are experts in different industries. So um, you do have to kind of bring in ideas that maybe you don't think are good. <laughs> I do that all the time. Like, I'm like, well, I don't think this is such an idea, but if I can make it better, what would I do here? And, and that's coming back to, you know, did I make it better uh, for the group? And then maybe, you know, since the group, you helped out the group with, with kind of making the idea better, your idea that everyone else didn't think was a good idea can get in there. It's definitely, you know, it's, it's a balance. And that, that's why I kind of have that in there. Because a lot of what I do is uh, directing traffic sure. and being sensitive to people's opinions. Right. Um, right. And never really shutting. I think it, key, though, is not to shut down anyone at the beginning. What I like to do is show it to them. Be like, okay, let's get it down. Let's write it down. And then let's see it not work. Because then that's a, then you can see the bad idea in action, at least in a prototype. Oh, that's okay, some good. of the ways. That, yeah, thank you. But yeah, definitely. I could probably do a whole, like. <laughs> we, we, we have to invite you again, Travis. <laughs> um, and then we, we talk about the, 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 the next advanced steps. Thank you so much for your presentation. If, if that would be in, in, in a real meeting, you would get um, a lot of applause now from us. So thank you very much for doing that. We go to the next presentation, which will be um, by Wouter de Konig. Um, Wouter is a professor at the University of Manitoba in, in Canada. Um, his research focus on precision measurement of the electroweak sector of the standard model. Um, Wouter has also strong interest in connecting physics to engineering, um, including um, lectures on how innovations make it from research labs into commercial products. Um, he's a key member of um, EIC Canada, and um, he is making, has made in, in a recent years, strong contributions to EIC software. Related to that, he will present today some results from user-centered design um, for, for the EIC. Um, well, I'm looking forward to your presentation. I will give you a warning after tw 12 minutes. Okay, can you hear me? Very well. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction, Marcus. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about work that's, uh, that was done by a, a group of people um, at Jefferson Lab, BNL, ANL, and here in Manitoba. Um, and there's two parts to us, to, to this uh, um, presentation. Uh, uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about the state of software survey, which is uh, the first of an annual survey of software use in the IC user group. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, the focus groups that have followed this survey. Um, which were in depth and, and at this point um, oriented around uh, where in the career stage the, the users are. Um, and so we call this user-centered design because we are a, a user group and we're focusing on users of our software. Um, the broader field in which this, this kind of work fits is, is, called, is often called human-centered design. Um, of course, all of our users are humans. Um, and, and, and of course, we hope that all humans are willing to be users. Um, <coughs> So you'll see some of the things come back, of course, from Travis's talk um, in particular, or, or the goal of these user surveys and the focus groups is, is user research, which was what goes into the, um, the first stage of, uh, of software development, development where you're setting up um, requirements. Um, we're also gonna be talking about user personas um, or also what we term user profiles. Um, so, User-centered design, first listen to the users and then start developing software, um, which, which doesn't mean that um, once you start developing software, you should stop listening to the users, but it's important to put this user-centered um, user research uh, step first. Um, so we've got a couple of steps here, um, the state of software survey, focus groups, and essentially developing a testing community. Um, that leads into what we wanna do with discoverable software that leads into how um, we want to make, um, how we want to design workflows that are in line with what the users want. Um, and all of that leads in, in, in our grand scheme of things to, um, to data analysis preservation, um, which we are hoping to um, encourage through the workflows and the discoverable software uh, approaches that are following out of uh, user-centered design. 
Um, you'll see some of the discoverable software things come back in the last talk today um, about key for hub um, and you'll see some of the workflow things come back in the next talk by Sylvester. So, um, so let's start with the state of software survey. Um, this was a software distributed through the EIC user group um, via the mailing list as a distribution methodology. Um, the data collection for this year has been completed. Um, so if you have suggestions about what we should have been, should have done different, um, we will be happy to consider them for inclusion in the next software survey. But as you are familiar with um, physics experiments, uh, you can't change the trigger after the fact. So consider the, the data collection part as, you know, this was the trigger that we took the data with um, and we can't change that now. So if you don't agree with that, there's, there's an opportunity to make that uh, change uh, next next year. Obviously, we learn at every stage um, about what maybe we should have asked um, in addition or what we should have asked uh, in, in, uh, um, instead. Uh, we try to maintain a balance in this user survey between collecting a lot of information and getting actual responses without uh, inducing survey fatigue. So um, we try to limit the number of questions to less than 10. Uh, to get a, a large number of um, um, of, uh, of responses. So the first question we included, well, what is uh, the current role in the EIC project? And you see that mainly we got answers from um, uh, sort of mid-career type um, uh, people. This was reflecting to some extent um, that uh, the people who contributed to the yellow report were sort of in this postdoc early career stage um, of their, their career. Uh, we did have some uh, more junior people um, and we had some senior scientists. Um, if you look at the labor distribution that is projected for the EIC, there's some differences here, of course. Um, we do anticipate that this number of PhD students will be much more represented once the EIC um, effort actually kicks off um, or, or you know, even already now. Um, people are hiring more PhD students than they've been able to do in the last couple of years. So that is something that we do try to take into account. Um, in our, our focus groups by oversampling then in the PhD student category um, and then undersampling in some of the other um, categories where we have lots of participants in the in the surveys. Otherwise, it agrees pretty well. Um, a first question we asked was uh, over the past year, which physics um, event generation tools did you use? Um, and uh, so we're, we're, we're showing here the responses that we got, um, all responses that had at least um, two respondents um, and, and uh, uh, that, um, uh, that were listed. Um, and um, it's possible that some, uh, it was possible for the, uh, the respondents to, uh, to check multiple boxes. The average number of responses was two. Um, so most people use Giant 4 particle guns as uh, an event generation tool um, or Pythia 8, Pythia 6, and so on. I'm not going to read, the, read them um, all the time. Uh, there's some uh, responses that I'm going to put here that were listed under other, um, and those were, um, were only appearing uh, once or in the case of personal computer codes, twice. Um, so that gives you an idea of which event generation tools I primar are primarily used by the EIC user group respondents to the survey. The next step is uh, which detector simulation tools um, did uh, respondents use for um, EIC simulations. Um, and here we see primarily root and JANT4, um, EIC smear and fun for all, sort of the, 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 the standard um, approaches that we, uh, um, that we of course uh, all um, are familiar with. Um, the average number of selected options was slightly over um, two here. So uh, again, people are using multiple um, options and there are some options that were um, selected only um, one by one respondent each. And after detector simulation, of course, there's uh, analysis tools. Um, which analysis tools did you use for uh, EIC simulation? Again, an average of two responses per respondent um, with root clearly leading the pack, um, it's it's hard. It's still hard to avoid root. Um, I think 24% of the respondents um, are are apparently able to do that. Um, the then uh, Jupiter and Python. We do realize there's there's somewhat of an overlap, um, an, an unclear 
maybe overlap between Jupiter and Python um, is all of the Python in Jupiter. Do people use Jupiter only with Python um, or do they also use other kernels? So this is one of the examples where um, we might have um, asked this question differently um, had we known that, there, that this would, uh, would lead to this kind of uh, confusion. Um, and you can sort of see the, uh, the distribution um, for the other, other packages, fun for all, ESC root, and then some of the smaller um, applications. Again, some of the uh, responses that uh, were given only once. Then which resources do EIC users who responded to the survey use? Um, uh, the vast majority uses their local computer um, and then computing resources at the national labs or at their institutions. Um, there's at this point uh, hardly any use of, of national computing facilities outside of these um, resources at the national labs or at the institution. And there's no, um, there was no one who, uh, who responded to this survey who used commercial cloud um, providers at all. Uh, so again, people are usually using um, at least uh, or an average of, of a less, slightly less than two um, different systems to, uh, or different resource categories to get their work done. Um, how did they access these computing facilities? And so local computer access um, for the majority of these uh, um, responses and then command line systems on remote systems a command line on, on remote systems, um, but also some uh, users were using web-based interfaces, um, were using X forwarding or uh, remote desktop systems. Again, people are usually using um, heterogeneous ways um, and, and an average of two approaches um, to reach their, uh, their computing resources. So then we asked for some open-ended comments and um, I'm, I'm listing here the majority or, or the recurring um, comments uh, from uh, from respondents to the survey. So there's too many generators and simulation tools at the moment, which came back five times out of, you know, a total of, uh, of 65 um, participants. So that's a fairly uh, um, a large repetition rate. Um, then lack of documentation and more tutorials would be beneficial. It also came back a couple of times. Um, and then uh, one, one comment was that uh, the, the software working group, presumably, um, should focus on the full Gian 4 simulation. So that's kind of the summary of this uh, state of software survey. Um, at the end of the presentation uh, in the appendix, there's the full list of questions with the language in which they were asked um, and, the, um, and the, the list of the, um, the, the options that uh, users could, could choose from. So let me move on to the next step and the next phase of this, uh, um, of this presentation, and that's on this these focus groups, the user focus groups, um, which we organized based on um, the user, the state of software survey. Um, so the selection methodology for who we wanted to include in those focus groups was based on um, the people who volunteered during the focus group and then complemented with some uh, personal contacts of the people who were uh, involved in this user-centered design um, effort. Uh, at this point, uh, the first focus groups were based on career stage. Um, so we anticipate that in the future, we might have focus groups that are based on specific software used, specific use case, specific um, uh, physics analysis that people are involved in. But at this point, it was, it was easiest to get this started on, uh, based on, on career stage. Um, and so that's what I'm presenting on here. Um, again, this is work by, by a larger group of people. And um, of course, we want to already in advance thank everyone who participated in these focus groups um, who shall remain anonymous um, to, to protect their, um, their responses, the confidentiality of their responses. Uh, but we do want to thank everyone who participated in these, these focus groups already because they have been very, very helpful. So in terms of the grouping criterion, um, as I mentioned, we use career stage. We had two graduate students participate, um, four junior postdocs, three senior postdocs, five staff scientists. Um, we still have um, two focus groups to be scheduled, which is um, one focus group from uh, for professors, um, uh, where we have uh, uh, identified uh, five um, candidates, and then um, we have ten candidates of physicists in nuclear physics um, who have left the field, um, uh, left the academic research field, I should say, um, and who are now physicists employed in industry. Um, so both of those are still 
um, are remaining to be scheduled. The approach that we took during these focus groups was a prompted discussion um, about an hour to an hour and a half, depending on um, the, the, the time available for um, the participants um, and centered around a couple of questions like what software are you currently using and why? Um, are you able or do you feel comfortable performing the computational aspects? What kind of barriers are you encountering? What are you enjoying about it, about the work that you're doing? Um, what do you think other physicists, what do you think is stopping other physicists from participating? Um, and which software tools, even if not EIC related, do you actually enjoy using? Um, of course, the, quest, the last question was for us to, to gauge um, what, what is going on in those tools that make them particularly enjoyable to use? And can we, um, can we replicate some of their, their features? Walter, you're 12 minutes in. 12 minutes left or? In, so you have three minutes okay. left. Okay. Um, so uh, we identified a number of attributes for users that we wanted to characterize, to use to, to, help, to, um, to help characterize these discussions. Um, low versus high experience, um, self-identification as user versus a developer, um, the desire for guidance versus more of a self-starter mentality, need for custom software versus no need for custom software if it's already available as off-the-shelf functionality, and attitudes towards the process of writing software and attitudes towards other users of the software, emotional or career investment in software for example someone who is actually uh, developing software because it's part of their job description versus someone who is doing it just even if it's not part of their job description um, low versus high ability to influence the community so this is the the boss effect um, that travis pointed to as well through positional power or the power of expertise and we connected some of that with general personality traits in the in the big five um, personality trait model um, particular openness to new experiences, which leads to a distinction between more conservative behavior in adopting software versus creative creativity um, when uh, developing new software, conscientiousness, which is you know quick and dirty hack jobs versus an architecture that is well developed, maybe too well developed, um, and then the ability to compromise, which is then um, uh, autonomous development of software versus cooperative development of software um, in a group. So then um, we went through uh, a, a process of uh, scoring all participants on each attribute, normalizing using k-means clustering principal component. Now, ob obviously, we didn't do that. Um, this is not the way we uh, approached this. We used a qualitative um, approach where we took similar statements by multiple participants in focus groups and tried to identify where there's common themes in those focus groups. Um, so this is a qualitative approach um, because, of course, uh, we're trying to get uh, qualitative information out of this process. Um, we're not trying to do a quantitative analysis here. We uh, are now working towards um, personas and user profiles. And so we have a couple of, uh, we have two sets of, uh, of directions in which we're thinking, um, which we, we are hoping to reconcile. So one uh, axis along with, on, one set of axes along which we're trying to distinguish the users is based mainly on um, experience and the attitudes towards writing software. So we have starting scientists who are new to the field, don't know how to get information and, and are very dependent on others. We have starting scientists with um, computer science experience um, who don't necessarily need the help um, with programming, but are still dependent on others um, with uh, for med much of what they do. Um, we've got some software using scientists um, who are not interested in programming, but they can do it if they have to um, and wish for more documentation. We have software using scientists who like programming and who contribute documentation to projects. Um, they're not quite software developing scientists who are active developers of projects and frameworks um, or who uh, another a category of software developing scientists who are high, have a higher level um, perspective based on their extensive experience in the field. And then we have software project owning scientists who are in charge of an entire software project, um, which could be something that um, is, is uh, um, part of a, a larger group of people, or it could be a small group of people that they're just in charge of, or even an individual large software project. So that's one way in which we're moving towards personas and user profiles, in which we've split up um, the, the participants in the focus groups in, uh, in seven um, 
seven uh, themes. Another separation is along the attitudes towards users primarily. Um, so software as a necessary tool. Um, so I like software to the extent that it helps me get physics done. Um, then people who are who are aware that their software or, or programming is not their strong suit, they're a bad programmer, don't force me to share my code. Um, so the, some of this, this is, these are not actual quotes, but they're based on what some people said, and they're a combination of, uh, of, of different statements. Software is part of my research. So I use software tools for my research project. I'm, I'm comfortable using it, um, and I share my software developments, but it's not my priority. And software is a social activity. Um, uh, somewhat surprising, there were some people who said that they like to write software with and for others, and, and actually, you know, like Git as uh, and, and GitHub as a, as a platform, especially for that reason. Um, they, they write software pretty well, and they want to help people who don't like it. And then we have what, we, uh, what we've started to term software emperors, um, who write the best software, they, they know how it should be written, just, just do what they say, um, and, and you'll be all fine. Um, and and to, to some extent, the, the, this category includes um, both uh, people on the high experience side, but then also people on the, on the slightly um, more on the low experience side uh, who, are, who are in the, you know, the, the, the Dunning-Kruger um, value um, part of the, um, their experience where uh, they think they can do everything because they know a little bit about something. Of course, a lot of comments came out of these um, focus groups, um, and I will um, actually leave this up for the discussion because I'm not going to read um, all of these comments. Um, I will just leave the this slide up um, while we uh, while we go in into questions, um, and I'm just going to go to the last um, slide and then come back to it. Um, so I do want to thank everyone who participated in the state of software survey and in the focus groups. Um, and the next steps for us are to take these focus groups, discussions, um, turn them into personas and user stories, really, um, and then also expand um, the focus groups in, in, um, in other directions. And hopefully these user stories um, based on these personas will provide um, software developers with um, useful information about which kind of users they're writing software for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wouter, for this great overview of what work is happening regarding user-centered design for the EIC. Um, you took most of your discussion time um, to, to finish the, the presentation. There is one question, so um, let's allow a fast question and then we go to the, um, to the, to the next um, presentation. Um, the question disappeared. Has this been on purpose? We have time for a question. One. Well, um, I, I think my enthusiasm to keep the meeting on time um, ruined your, your, your question, Walter. So, um, <laughs> so, so maybe um, you put the comments up for discussion. Um, would you maybe want to highlight you have you have minus half a minute, but do you want to maybe highlight one one question or one comment, and then we go to the to the next presentation? Yeah, so I'm not going to um, focus on the ones that are related to to documentation because I already talked about that earlier. Um, but some that I want to highlight is um, people are are appreciating containers, but they're also pointing out that containers have their drawbacks. Uh, for example, debugging. Um, and another approach, another attitude that um, I think as a, as a field we need to counteract is um, the, the attitude that people say, no one is going to use my code anyway, so I'm not going to share it. Um, so if I wanted to, to pick two um, examples here that I think everyone should, should kind of keep in their mind, uh, those, those would be two, two comments that I think um, have a potential to, uh, to affect how we, we think about software. Thank you. And, and if, if someone has comments or questions, please put them in the live notes. Um, we, will, we will have a look there. Um, I'm pretty sure Wouter will also have, have a look just to continue the discussion there. Um, we then go to the um, second presentation and, and we, we share a little bit what would be really classical user-centered design to be how make it easier for users to work. And, and part of this is workflows. The speaker here will be Sylvester Josen from 
um, Argonne National Laboratory, where he is a staff scientist. Um, Sylvester um, is part of uh, his research is part to deepen our understanding of um, the strong interaction. Examples are his work on hadronization and semi-inclusive measurements of deep elastic scattering and, and, um, and his, his work on how the proton mass emerges um, from the uh, um, gluonic structure. Um, Sylvester is also a software developer at heart and he will present um, um, forward looking workflow which he and his colleagues um, developed at, at, at Argon. Sylvester, I will also give you um, a warning 12 minutes in your presentation. Um, okay, am I muted now? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Marcus. Um, let me... I go back to my first slide. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm presenting the software R&D that we did as part of an LDRD project at Argonne uh, with regards to automated workflows. Um, I'm not giving this talk with my uh, you know, um, EIC at IP6 head on, but this is really the work that we did at Argonne over the last uh, uh, two years as part of this project. And it's work that we did you know, with a big team uh, that was involved. Um, okay, so... The work is aimed at EIC. Uh, for EIC, we get to do the fantastic thing where we get a new accelerator and we get to design new detectors from scratch. Um, we have um, many requirements that the community has, uh, has spent a lot of time studying. Uh, the latest ones are from the EIC yellow report, um, where we have a set of requirements that are for detector and reconstruction. Um, it's really an extensive list of key performance parameters to inform detector choices. Um, this table that you see on the left uh, top, of course, uh, looks kind of tantalizingly like uh, uh, it could be implemented as a series of automized tests that a detector implementation needs to pass, uh, which allows you to tweak and uh, you know swap out different te detector technologies, change pixel sizes, etc to really try to converge on a detector that's, that fits all of these uh, performance parameters. Um, of course, besides the easily quantifiable ones, we also have a you know, series of physics requirements. In the left, I show the, the, the index of physics topics, uh, main physics topics that were uh, covered in the yellow report, um, as well as you know, there's, of course, many new developments that are happening and will happen in the next 10 years uh, before EIC starts and will keep happening while EIC is running. So, Really, the key here is to design a detector that is able to take many key physics uh, measurements while it's flexible enough to accommodate new developments uh, that um, you know, could completely change the scope of the physics we're doing with this detector throughout the next couple of decades. So how do we, you know, sort of in a diagram uh, foresee doing this type of process? So, um, you know, to do this process, really, we need a very modular interoperable toolkit. Um, we start from different types of event samples that comes from generators, either simple tracks or physics events that then need to be uh, propagated through a potentially large set of variations of detector geometries that then need to uh, be assimilated, digitized, reconstructed, and then need to be benchmarked either for detector or reconstruction performance or for uh, physics performance. So I'll go quickly through these different, these different uh, boxes just to give a bit of an idea of what, uh, what tools we're using for this, although the tools are really not the main focus of this presentation. Um, event generation, uh, we standardized around uh, HEPMC3 data formats. Um, we, uh, we have two types uh, of uh, events. Uh, some are, of course, simple tracks, particle gun, uh, which are used to validate detector and benchmark the reconstruction chain versus uh, essentially those yellow report parameters. Um, and then there are the physics events that are used to characterize and benchmark different detector setups for desired physics of observables. And uh, here, you know, to really do this, we need a fully integrated setup uh, for on-demand event generation to cover all the NAS as well as yellow report science requirements for the electron ion collider. Um, Importantly, you know, a lot of this is tied together and being able to easily get different variations of the same detector as well as use, you know, something that's normally a different detector with its own variations. Um, for this, there's only 
one tool available that makes this somewhat easy, that is DD4HEP. So we use uh, parameterized detector descriptions using DD4HEP. Um, we have our own uh, extension for DD4HEP called NPDET, uh, which adds, adds a couple extra parameterized detector classes for nuclear physics, such as Trankov counters, um, as well as uh, various uh, extra tools that leverage CD4HEP, you know, for visualization, for conversions, for uh, inspection uh, of the detector. Um, and DD4HEP here really at heart is a single unique source for geometry that both dispatches or full jam for simulation and that provides the geometry as a service during the reconstruction step. And, uh, you know, going forward, we aim towards a library of configurable detectors where we identify which parameters are the ones that, that really need to be uh, uh, changeable and are really the key parameters that will determine the, the detector performance. Um, here's an overview of our main toolkit and I will actually not go through this list because uh, uh, I want to make the remark that you know throughout our last couple of years we converged clearly on the same approach that the uh, key for hep project is taking and seeing as the next presentation is by key for hep I don't see uh, a strong need to go through this in detail but it's a uh, you know, it's an approach based on modern tools uh, developed by the high energy physics community. Um, so building the software. Software is uh, uh, fully containerized and automatically deployed. Um, for this, we leverage our own GitLab server instance uh, called EIC Web, uh, which uh, with advanced uh, continuous integration enabled and uh, linked to a dedicated build cluster that we use to automatically build our containers and run uh, the, the most of our uh, CI workflows. Um, to build our container, we, uh, we use PAC, um, which gives us a reproducible build process for the container, as well as uh, you know, very clearly documented uh, versioning of all the software. Um, we build a Docker container. This is what's used in the CI tool chain, and in principle, also what you'd want to use if you want to do local development on a Mac-based uh, uh, computer. Um, we then also built a singularity container of this Docker container, which we use for deployment to HPC environment and for local development on Linux-based uh, systems. Um, so the sort of workflow we're going is a bit of a new paradigm in physics. It's not really a new paradigm in standard um, uh, you know, software, in the standard software out world. Uh, we're essentially using the, the classic CI CD approach uh, you know, to use it for detector design and physics benchmarks. But let me just give a bit of jargon um, that maybe not everyone is uh, intimately familiar with. So uh, CI, CD, that's continuous integration and deployments. Um, within CI, CD, we run pipelines. A pipeline is a, connect a collection of interdependent jobs that run in a certain sequence, like a pipeline. A job is a single task within this pipeline. Uh, so it, you can sort of see it as a script that runs and that produces some side effects, which then are used by the next uh, step in the pipeline. An artifact are files that are produced by a job that upload, are uploaded back to the GitLab server that uh, can inform the next uh, or control the next pipeline. And a pipeline trigger is essentially a set of pipelines that are connected through each other where you trigger the operation of one pipeline based on the results or environment that's, uh, that is used for the previous pipeline. So um, really, you know, the, the setup that we uh, came up with is really many repositories that are chained together, which are organized within GitLab groups. So uh, um, you see for the, the left or top level EIC directory, um, you know, EIC group in GitLab, and then we have a benchmark subgroup which has detector benchmarks, some common benchmark code, physics benchmarks, and reconstruction benchmarks. We have our detectors group, which has a lot of detector implementations, as well as some accelerator and interaction point details in it. Um, let me give a couple of examples of uh, using pipelines in this way. So, uh, um, you know, one very obvious way thing to do is, of course, automated uh, detector tests. And here, you know, you see a pipeline. So it's, you see, we would configure our environment, we build our detector uh, plugins, um, we build documentation, we do tests, and then we make a report. And then we have a deploy step where we trigger downstream pipelines that I'll get back to in the next slide. Um, but as part of the main, the main setup here, we, uh, we uh, 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 have tests where we check, uh, for example, geometry overlaps 
um, which happens as part of every single merge request. So the, we can guarantee that whatever geometry that we uh, that we actually merge into our uh, our master branch is uh, guaranteed to be a valid geometry. Um, we also automatically uh, generate documentation, um, which in this case is, for example, detector visualizations, which saved as are saved as browsable uh, job artifacts. Okay, a word about pipeline triggers. So, you know, to really unlock the power and really get to this uh, sort of flow diagram that I showed on my third slide, um, you need to connect different pipelines together. So here on the top, I show uh, the same, you know, sort of, you know, with some parts cut out, the same, uh, the same pipeline for the, the one of the detector implementations. And you can see there's a deploy step here, where in the deploy step, we trigger two downstream pipelines. One is our physics benchmarks that runs some DIS um, uh, uh, analyses. It runs some DBCS analysis right now and some DVMP analysis, which are then the results of those are collected and some uh, uh, summary is then uh, published, which right now is just saved as a GitLab artifact. Down the line, this, uh, this we will use as a basis to generate uh, a uh, web page that summarizes all of these details. Um, at the same time, it will also trigger the reconstruction benchmarks that will do specific tests aimed at testing various reconstruction uh, um, uh, key parameters. Um, this type of dispatch doesn't just, you know, work from this detector um, um, implementation to these benchmarks. We, for example, also have this from Juggler. Juggler is our uh, um, our main uh, reconstruction program. Um, whenever we write a new reconstruction algorithm, it will, of course, you know, trigger the different benchmarks. It will trigger the physics benchmarks. It will trigger the reconstruction benchmarks, and they will run to make sure that we have proper operation within uh, with these new. Uh, um, um, algorithms. There are some open challenges in this workflow. We really need a full library of Monte Carlo generators that cover the entire yellow report program. Um, that's, you know, a big task and it's uh, something that we uh, need the entire community for. That's not something that's, you know, a small group does on their own. Um, automated publication documentation of performance uh, parameters to a web page is important for discoverability. Uh, compilation uh, and combination of metrics for benchmarks to guide optimization is a non-trivial um, um, non process, or including how to weigh the you know, different performance on different physics benchmarks, for example. Um, distributed data persistency is required um, as you know, uploading giant root files, for example, to GitLab to then download them in different pipeline steps is not a scalable approach. So for that, you know, something like Ruscio down the line would be the ideal solution. Um, and then there is a dispatch to HPC itself that, um, you know, there doesn't have a single solution. Ideally, you'd like to treat HPC as a Kubernetes cluster, but that's typically not going to happen. Um, so, you know, right now we use a solution where we run a custom uh, singularity GitLab uh, runner that interacts with the uh, HPC system, um, but, Maybe in the future, even manual pre-computations might be um, a, a valid approach to get some of the expensive, uh, expensive parts of the pipeline taken care of beforehand. You so are like five minutes into this. So. Okay, I will just give a quick example. This won't take very long, but I, I think it's it's uh, nice to sort of uh, um, because all of this sounds very theoretical and very complicated to uh, sort of highlight the sort of simplicity of certain workflows that are enabled by this approach. So let's, uh, let's uh, explore a purely browser-based workflow example. And let's say, you know, we have an XML file, dd 4 hep stores in the end, it's um, for dd 4 hep in the end, we store all of our um, important parameters for our, um, um, for our geometries in an XML file. Say, hey, I want to change the vertex tracker radius one from 30 millimeters to 29 millimeters. And this here is a file that I have on GitLab. What is involved? Well, as you see, there is this edit button here on GitLab. Let's click the edit button and an IDE opens. In this IDE, we can then change this value here to 29 millimeters. We can then commit the changes to a new branch um, see, here's the change, 30 millimeters to 29 millimeters. From this new branch, we can then create a new merge request. We tweak the radius. 
And this merge request will then trigger the CI pipelines that start running, they start running the documentation, then uh, do all the tests and uh, you know, do all the downstream actions that we've seen before. And uh, this will run a very large amount of software that's, you know, normally it would require people to uh, be very familiar with whatever environment they're running in. Um, but they are able to do this without leaving the browser or installing any software locally. Now that's not the only workflow. There's you know many workflows that people that people do, um, but um, it is you know very exciting uh, for me to see that really you can do you can do this work and you can work on say you know tweaking geometries around changing detector parts uh, uh, at some level without doing anything on your local system. So. I will you know, finalize um, and uh, show, show this slide here, which is a slide I've shown a couple of months before, um, but uh, it's still you know, the, our strategy. So it sort of places the workflow centered uh, R&D that we did in the context of the ESC users group software UI, where workflows is really one of the main parts, but there's many parts and you know, many other of these components that we touch on while we do our R&D on the workflows. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sylvester. It's really fascinating to see um, how this workflow really works and um, and and how modern it it is. Um, there um, is applause, and there is one question by Maxime. I don't see anything in the in the live notes. So, Maxime, please. Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I need to put it in, in the notes. So, I have one question and one comment. So, question is: uh, Have you compared the functionality? And features to the system, which is called Rihanna. Um, so Rihanna is something that we could use within this system. Um, it, you know, in, in a way, Rihanna has a lot of similarities to to the way that you would write a, a GitLab CI file in, in in practice. So I think there is definitely some overlap with Rihanna, and there is definitely a way that we could use Rihanna to solve part of the dispatch problem. So. Uh, um, it, it's something we're aware of and we're, we're thinking of. Right. I mean, uh, Rihanna's uh, deployments are most often based on a Kubernetes cluster. So that mm -hmm. depends on some of the concerns you had. And also exactly. persisting, persisting artifacts is can be just more transparent. You have more control over what's persisted and, and mm -hmm. how. Uh, so obviously, Rihanna can also describe arbitrary workflows. Uh, in, in a virgin way. Uh, and, and so this was the question, so just thank you. So the comment is actually this whole uh, issue of handling data, which is of course important. I mean, Rusio may or may not be the best match for this. However, uh, if you try to put some root files, X root D would be a perfect answer. Just, that's just my personal comment because it's, it's obviously dynamic. You start mm -hmm. a job, it can pull a file or a group of files very efficiently over the network and you're done. So thank you. Yep. Thank you. There is um, one more question. Um, Shivan. Oh, yeah. I, I just typed a question. So uh, I see, Sylvester, you did all the simulation, those running the back end, and there's a little bit of reconstruction possibility. Those at the GitLab uh, CI, you have a server, of course, dedicated for this. So I guess that means the GitHub. CI won't be able to, to do all of this, right? Maybe part of it, but not all. So I'm not super familiar with GitHub CI. I assume that a lot of the workflow you could do with GitHub as well, but it will be slightly different. Um, in the end, you know, the what we have is we have a program called GitLab Runner that's installed on uh, a couple of machines in a cluster. We have something like 500 cores right now that we're uh, running our uh, CI on. Um, which is dedicated for this, um, but I, I assume that for GitHub you can do something similar. I don't. I... It sounds like the resource required is something not going to be. Maybe they have it, just but you have to pay for something. It's like more advanced. If if I can comment quickly because I looked into that oh. with GitHub, so um, there is a possibility. There's plenty of similarities between this process on GitLab and GitHub, which is not surprising. It's, it's very similar, at least superficially. Uh, the question of runners, uh, just like GitLab, GitHub has the notion of external runners. So if you have a, a cluster you know, that's available, 
whatever it is, whatever technology you choose to use, um, GitHub can run your jobs on the resource of your choice. And I tried that by running CI jobs on my computers at home, which just works, right? And it can scale to a facility. That's the content of my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you again to Sylvester. Um, this was really very interesting to see, although related to our topic. The, we come to the final presentation um, for today. Um, that is um, by Andre Seiler. He is a staff scientist at, at CERN. So last presentation were a little bit EIC related. Now we come to click and future colliders, uh, other future colliders related. Um, Andre is responsible for the continued development of the click distributed computing and simulation and reconstruction software. And um, he is supporting um, detector optimization studies and physics analysis. Um, he today talks in his role as one of the main facilitators of the key for help project, as was already mentioned um, in uh, the previous presentation, where he leads um, the effort by the CERN Experimental Physics Group. Um, and um, his, um, his role here is also to enhance the synergy of the developments between um, FCC CLIC and um, other future um, collider projects. Um, Andre, I'm looking forward to your um, presentation. And as in the, for the previous um, presenters, I will give you a warning when you are 12 minutes in. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. And you can confirm that you can see my slides. Yes. And I can also change them, yes. <laughs> Okay, you see the second slide now? Yes. Okay. Okay, yeah, so I will talk about the, the key for help turnkey software stack that was already mentioned and already also some of the tools that we are using as part of key for help were already mentioned. Um, so I will, I will begin with a brief introduction and introduce the vision that we have for the turnkey software stack and kind of the the goal, the ultimate goal that we want to achieve with this uh, software stack. And then I talk about the some ingredients that go into, into key for help um, give, give a few examples. I'll mention documentation and end with a brief summary. So what is the vision? Well, the vision is that we want to create a software stack that connects and extends individual packages towards a complete data processing framework for detector studies with fast or full simulation, reconstruction, and for analysis. So uh, to, to fulfill this vision, we, we need some major ingredients for that, which is an event data model, uh, so that all the different pieces can talk to each other and, and speak the same language. We have to know about the geometry information well, for simulation, reconstruction. Uh, there needs to be some source of, of this geometry information. And we need a processing framework that well, executes all the, the tasks that we have to, to run for simulation reconstruction and so on. Now, um, we, we want to have one framework in, in, a, in a diverse community because if we can share common components, of course, this reduces the overhead for, for the users. And users here is very broad in the sense of anybody that wants to do detector uh, simulation studies. Um, it should be easy to use for, for the librarians, which have to deploy the software in some way, uh, for developers that have to extend the software, and for the users that have to set up or uh, use the software. And as part of key for help we want to have uh, we want to, it to have it to be full of functionality, so there should be plenty of examples uh, how people can run simulation and reconstruction of detectors project essentially members of uh, FCC, ILC, CPC, uh, CS, SCT, and, and CLIC agreed to work on this common software stack. Uh, so from, from the linear collider world, so ILC and CLIC, uh, we, we were using ILC soft. Uh, CPC also started kind of on ILC soft, and then they wanted to develop a newer, a newer framework um, and had almost just begun their work on this. Um, well, FCC and, and SCT, they, they were working on a Gaudi-based framework, um, but they were also interested in, in some of the tools that were available in ILC soft. Uh, same for CEPC, they wanted to, to continue using the tools and there were also tools going into uh, FCC software that, that were of interest for, for the linear collider studies. So uh, it was kind of a, a perfect moment to, to decide the, 
to start working on this and, and also uh, keep uh, preserving uh, and also adapting the existing functionality. So uh, for the ingredients, well, we have the, the key for HAP event data model, EDM for HAP. Um, as I said, if the packages talk the same language, then it's easy to, to uh, plug them together. Um, and we create this event data model using PodIO, uh, same as, as this is also used for, for EIC. Um, and this event data model is described by a YAML file. So you describe your objects and, and what types they contain, and then PodIO will create uh, the necessary libraries for you. And uh, uh, you can have different uh, persistency layers. So input output to, to root or to this simple IO, which came out of the ILC soft LCRO event data model. And uh, if there are more developments for, for the pod IO backends, then of course you directly gain also for EDM for HEP or for the EIC and data model out of that. This EDM for HEP data model is based on LCAO and, and the FCC EDM that already had been developed on, on PodIO. Um, and by keeping some of this consistency with LCAO, it's also more or less straightforward to, to uh, adapt tools to, to this key for HEP framework. And actually, in, in our work, uh, key for HEP, we triggered some developments in PodIO where, where we saw things missing or could be improved, like, like this new backend, uh, replace the, the custom templating for, for this library source code with, with a new way, working on metadata, multi-threading, and, and schema evolution. And EDM for HEP uh, is to be used at, at basically any stage of, of this key for HEP uh, framework so that really you, ha you have this interoperability between the packages and you can replace steps by equivalent steps that produce the same output. For the data processing framework, well, we've chosen Gaudi. Um, uh, well, there were some con considerations for that, and, and uh, Gaudi is the one that is uh, furthest developed for, for different heterogeneous computing resources. Um, it supports concurrency, and there's a larger developer community because it's also used by the LHCB and Atlas experiments. And of course, if we find some feature missing, then we'll contribute developments uh, where we see a need for it. For the geometry information, we're also using DD4 HEP. It was very nice to see the use in, in EIC uh, of DD4 HEP, as I'm also one of the developers of this package. Um, and it, it provides the single source of geometry uh, for, for all stages of the experiment um, and also for the life cycle. So now we maybe start with our concept development, but for, for optimization and maybe later construction operation, we can still use DD4 HEP. Uh, it's already used by ILC, Click, and FCC, um, and also now it's it's being picked up by by CMS and and LHCB, and I guess I can add EIC to this list as well. So, so I mentioned the ILC soft tools; uh, uh, they're using a different well event data model and also different uh, uh, different framework to run. But there's there's many. Uh, really battle tested uh, tools in there for, for tracking particle flow clustering, flavor tagging, particle ID. They have been developed over, over almost decades now. Um, and of course you, you can't throw this away. Uh, it's, it's way too expensive to replace them just like that. So we, we wrote a, a, a wrapper around the, the, the Marlin processors that we now call K4 Marlin wrapper. And uh, by using this wrapper, the, the user code or the code inside these, these, these Marlin processes, processes does not have to change. You can directly call them from, from the Gaudi uh, execution. And there's, a, there's an example uh, of how this configuration works. So you set up a Marlin processor, you give it some name, you define the type of, of processor you, you want to run from Marlin, and then you can configure an arbitrary number of parameters. Uh, and then this wrapper will convert the LCAO event data. Uh, sorry, it converts EDM for app to LCAO, which is then consumed by the Marlin processor, and then it then converts LCAO uh, to EDM for app, and then it's it's seamlessly integrated with the rest of the tools in in the key for app framework execution. So for packaging, we adopted SPAC. Uh, it was already mentioned in the previous talk also for for this this workflow. Um, this means that uh, well, essentially, we, we go beyond the sharing of the build results that, that someone builds uh, on their uh, integration machines, but actually the build recipes, so essentially everybody can reproduce 
a build of the software stack. Uh, this spec uh, package manages large community supporting the recipes uh, for, well, basically all the packages that are in our stack, except the ones that we build on top that are directly key for app related. But DD4 app uh, recipe was already existing by, well, actually uh, a non DD4 app developer contributed this. And uh, so uh, it, it really eases the, the workload on the librarians and developers. Uh, and it enables one to build any and all the pieces of the stack. Um, and yeah, we use this for, for the nightly builds and also the releases of the stack and, and can also be used by developers. So now some examples. Uh, one of the, the pieces that were implemented for, for uh, key for help is uh, this Delphi's fast simulation tool. Uh, we extended this to create uh, EDM for app output files so we can later consume them or uh, replace Delphus by the full simulation tool. So this is the, the coherent approach where, well, everything speaks the same language. And yeah, and then you can later plug and play uh, with, with, the, with the full simulation, also higher level reconstruction tools. Um, for the full simulation, uh, this still needs to be integrated into the into the framework. There's tools in the FCC software uh, that just need to be ported to key for help to make this available. Uh, there's also this uh, DD Sim Python executable part of DD for help, uh, which can also produce EDM for help output. Um, and well, it's very simple to use just by by providing command line uh, arguments to to say underscore edm for dot root, and then you have a edm for help output file. Um, there's some work needed to, to really merge these two approaches. Uh, they're slightly differently using plugins for, for sensitive detectors. So we do need to put some more work into, into making this coherent so we don't lose uh, features that are in one and not in the other. So for the fast uh, uh, or replacing fast simulation by full simulation, well, uh, once we have uh, we have our, our full simulation tool, we can just uh, replace the stealth simulation by by the full simulation and call, for example, this flavor tagging reconstruction uh, via the Marlin wrapper that is part of ILC soft and and keep working uh, with our existing tools. Then, well, here's an example of how to run the full simulation. Uh, there's a link to the documentation, which gives a lot more details uh, also for the further step. So uh, we deploy our software to CVMFS. So you can always find a, a fresh installation there. Um, okay, for, for this example, you have to get the, the click uh, steering files um, from, from our click performance package. And then you could already start running the, the simulation with the DDSIM tool. Um, here it still produces LCO as the output uh, as, okay, we need to, in the next, well, few weeks, hopefully implement the, 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 the direct convert, well, using the direct conversion from, from EDM for help to LCO to call our, our software. And then here's the, the running first with the Marlin framework, the, the click reconstruction, giving the same geometry information and input file. And in, if you follow this link, you see there are a few more commands that, which can convert this uh, this XML steering file into a, into the, the Python steering file for Gaudi, and then you could run the the reconstruction via Gaudi with the K4 run. Uh, for documentation, uh, the main documentation page is, is hosted on, on GitHub, uh, so everybody can basically go in there and fix something and add things. Um, also the, the examples that are provided in the documentation. So like source this CMFS file, run this command. Um, they are tested via this, this note down tool. So that converts the, the markdown examples to a, to a Python notebook, which is then executed. And then you make sure your examples are always running correctly. And we also use Doxygen to create the, the API information for example, for EDM for help. Uh, another thing that uh, is, is, is very useful from at least my point of view, and I hope also from, from the user point of view, are these kind of self-documenting programs. So, well, it was mentioned before, writing documentation hard, keeping up to date is even more hard. Um, so ideally, if you have one place where code and documentation lives together, uh, it's easy to remember to update, also via code review to point out that maybe someone needs to update the documentation. 
And in ILCsoft, uh, this, this self-documenting program basically is Marlin, where you have minus X, which spits out an XML file with all the parameters and all the processes it knows about. So down here is an example uh, where you have, uh, well, you have this DG Planner Digi processor, and then it would print out the, uh, all the parameters you have for that, including this documentation strings that are written in the place where the, the parameters defined. Uh, for DDSIM, this is kind of the same approach. Here it's called dump steering file. It creates a doc config file uh, with all the uh, options and explanation. And you can also see this if you just run DDSIM minus minus help. Uh, if, you, if you use this Python tool with R completion, you can also get command line completion for, for all the options um, just by, by hitting tab, for example. For, for Gaudi, for the K4 run, there's, if you already have an existing steering file, because you have to kind of know which, which, uh, which uh, algorithms you want to load, you can also give the minus minus help flag and that prints out all the available parameters for, for all the tools that, that you have in your config. So that already brings me to my summary. Well, for, for Key4Hap, the turnkey software stack, we aim to provide a complete framework for detector optimization studies for future experiments. Uh, we incorporate existing and new solutions. Uh, we aim to provide examples that can be adapted for other use cases. And of course, interested parties are welcome to participate. At the moment, we basically, we have a weekly meeting at 9 a.m. Central European time, uh, alternating between key for help and edm for help discussions. We have contributors from China, Germany, Italy, CERN that represent this ILC, CLIC, FCC, and CPC communities. And if there is demand, we can find an occasional more US-friendly spot for these meetings. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Andre. This was a very lucid overview, but still you managed to get quite some details in. Um, uh, really fascinating. Um, are there questions to um, Andre? Um, I don't see anything at um, um, in the live notes. Um, I don't see any any hands up. Um, um, so maybe you mentioned contributors, but how large is the community which is currently using um, the key for help um, turnkey software stack? Well, you see the the list of uh, experiments. There's uh, for each one, I would say there's maybe a handful of developers that are maybe not all working all the time on key for help, but on pieces that could be considered to be called from key for help. So um, for, for CPC, uh, they, they're contributing, uh, or there's people working on a validation system that uh, uh, would be very useful for everybody else that, that uses key for help for their detector, that then they can implement a validation for this. Um, in, in Click right now, we're focusing on, on converting these, these reconstruction that we have to be run via Gaudi uh, so that also we can, we can directly use them then for the FCC reconstruction. Uh, FCC is working on porting the, the software to key for help So from their FCC software repository to, to key for help and also adapting to the event data model. Um, so the, yeah, there's, well, there's these four communities um and uh well yeah maybe a handful of developers each contributing part of their time there you you mentioned of course how how this all came together and and what um key for help turnkeys currently represents what would you say when you compare it to other software stacks um if you would make one or two bullet points what what are the things which which sets your parts from from other software stacks I think what sets us apart is that we have four different experiments working together on one software system. Um, we've done this for, for linear colliders. I mean, well, basically from the start, there, there was this LCO development, uh, the, the input output, uh, the EDM was developed for, for SIDs, so this ceiling detector based Slack. Um, and, and, and the other uh, experiments, uh, so ILD or, or what came before that. And when Click started, we, we uh, adopted this framework because that gave us a running start, basically. I mean, we didn't have to develop many things. We could adapt the detector to our environment and then start simulating and reconstructing. 
Um, and now I think we kind of continue this tradition by, by having the tools, showing that they work well and, have, and, and finding other users uh, for these things. Thank you. Um, also, if this would be a in-person meeting, you would now find a, a round of applause. So thank you very much, um, Andre. Um, that brings us to the end of um, the um, software and computing roundtable of, um, of May. Um, let me um, conclude by saying that the next meeting will be on uh, June uh, 1st. The topic will be, we will be talking about analysis tools, really focusing on analysis for the next um, discussions. And let me then finally end by wishing you today on May 4th um, that the forces may be with you. Thank you very much for your presentations. Thank you very much for, for attending. Um, talk to you soon, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. You bye-bye.